Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Global Math Department. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us who you are, where you join us from, and what is your Twitter handle if you have one. Welcome to the Global Math Department. My name is Rana Arshad Hafiz, and I'll be your host tonight. Tonight, we are going to hear from Joshua Bean about the art of asking questions. Would everyone please introduce themselves in the chat window, telling us what you teach, where and what your Twitter handle is if you have one. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to explain how these meetings work. These meetings are recorded and are available within 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you can use the same link you used to get here tonight. The global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. I'll be sure to catch your questions for the presenter to be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our speaker tonight is Joshua Bean. And I'm going to ask Joshua to introduce himself to us before he starts. Well, hello, all. Thank you. It's pretty incredible to see people from all over the world gathering here. I just want to say thank you for taking your time out. Thank you for arranging your days for this. And thanks for exploring such an amazing topic and one that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm a math teacher. I teach in uh, Southern California in Huntington Beach at a school called Edison High School. I've taught 24 years and I also give presentations like this. And this one is pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, it comes from my personal upbringing in philosophy and kind of how I've applied it to mathematics. So thank you all for joining me. I'm gonna to start today by talking about the influences on me here. I wanna give uh, appreciation and honor to the people who have trained me in these ways. One's my father there. Uh, Gary Bean, former LA police officer, used to take me to training days with him. And little did I know, he was my first teacher on how to be a teacher and also showed me how to lead others. And then there's Pierre Grimes right there. And Pierre Grimes is my philosophy mentor who I've studied with now for 27 years. And he basically taught me how to find my own questions and how to nurture them. And this is my application of the lessons from each of them. So Thanks to each of them, and I want to give honor to them before we continue. So first off, the goals of our exploration here today, we're going to explore how students relate to questions and why they relate to them as the way that they do. We're going to explore what a question is and the value one gets from having them. We're going to talk about the kinds of questions students ask and how teachers respond, and we're going to explore how to nurture a student's question, and then how to teach students how to ask questions. All in one hour, can you believe that? So first, I want you to take a moment and think about how do your students relate to the questions they have? And why do they relate to them the way that they do? So if you could just take a moment, Maybe write something in the chat, say how do your students relate to their questions and why do you think they relate to them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. With some <laughs> with some disinterest. <laughs> Well, from what I've seen, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, very much. Uh, this is, it's like you're predicting slides. Uh, we have the teacher here out there on the board, and they're asking the questions. And it's the student's job to answer. And to the students, a question is something that they answer in order to demonstrate understanding. And I really appreciate that, uh, that they're asking those questions answering questions, especially when we're guiding them through a lesson. And they often view them, though, as the thing which needs to be answered in order to get a grade. I like to call this the transactional model of answering questions. And it comes in the form of usually like our homework. We ask them questions, test questions. We ask them project questions. 
And when they give us answers to our questions, we hand them their 1,618 points. They hand us their points or their credit, and then we transfer them their A back and forth. And it's a transaction between if they answer our question right, then they get their answer right. This comes from definitely being programmed by our points-based grading system that we like to apply. And so they view questions only as an avenue to a grade. But a question is actually something deeper than that. And often, yes, I like how, you know, you said they're worried about giving wrong answers. And when they see when they have a question, you know, if they were to go into their own questions, they would think confusion or not knowing, oh, no, time to go anywhere else but here. And so they actually try to avoid their questions. And they often try to avoid their questions in class, again, because a question, uh, as was offered by Tracy in the chat, means that they don't understand. Sometimes people you know, think that that means they're a sign that they're stupid, or they want to avoid their questions because if they don't get the question right, then they could get a lower grade in the class. And so therefore, avoid that as much as possible. Don't want to be shamed by others and definitely don't want lower grades. So I'm here to try to break this habit of our students. So I'd like to begin with the next part is saying, we have a certain paradox when it comes to being teachers. When we teach, we give instructions from clarity and we see the whole picture. Whereas students, when we go through a learning process, if we're ever learning something, we don't go from clarity, we come from our not knowing or our confusion. I like to call that our ignorance. So here's a vision of we, what we have as teachers. We bring to the lesson our concepts, our applications, our prior knowledge, our examples, our pictures, all that comes together into a pretty whole for us, makes this beautiful house of understanding that we have here and demonstrates a complete vision to the students. This is really what the students come to it as like though. <laughs> they have anxiety and depression and yes, they have some concepts and they have some prior knowledge, but they also might have family pressure and maybe they have some self doubt and Maybe they have some examples in the backgrounds over there and a little crush up there uh, and some confusion and apathy. And if you notice, their pieces are much greater. So they don't, since that they don't have that hole that we have, they must, we must approach the learning in a different way for them. So oftentimes when we're instructing, and when we're learning in class, the students will be focused on knowing. They're, they're focused on like, I need to know this, I need to know this. And as teachers, we come at it through our knowledge. But in truth, nobody comes to know anything without first not knowing something. So that not knowing is where their questions lie. And that's the part that we really need to uncover for them and teach them how to find these questions within them because sometimes you know they have that sense of confusion but they don't really know what their question is so our ignorance is our doorway to discovering all of our insights follow from some experience of unknowing and learning is this process of going from ignorance to knowledge and as my favorite favorite uh uh, Neoplatonic philosopher says, mathematics is the preparation of the mind for insight. So as it is this preparation, it takes us through these stages. And these are kind of the steps of learning that I'd like for us to, to look at now. First, we start with, our, with ignorance. And then from ignorance, we move to a picture of something. We get an idea of what something is. We have an image of it. From there, we form beliefs about that, things we think are true. Sometimes those things are true. Sometimes they're not true. If we can then move from why the beliefs are true to, or from that they are true to why they are true, then we form understanding. And then if we can finally move from understanding to such when we have all of these pieces together within us, we have knowledge. And then there's a level above knowledge, which is mastery. And that's when one can tell all of these different stages that they see in front of us. And they're able to see the other people in these stages and help them through that. It's important for us when we're thinking about students' questions to know 
which level of these steps of learning are they at? Are they completely ignorant? Did they have some, some basic ideas? They have some proper beliefs, they have some wrong beliefs. Are they former, forming understanding and forming to discovering the principles of those true beliefs? Uh, do they have knowledge? And if they have knowledge, well then how can we push them to mastery? These steps, by the way, come from Plato's allegory of the cave, if you've ever read that. And so, and then it's also important for us to know this one thing, which I found pretty incredible when I discovered it. The word mathematics in English is derived from the Greek word mathema. And this word means what is learned by inquiry. So I like to say mathematics is learning. It also, as a verb, means the act of learning through inquiry. And so the key words here are learning and inquiry. And as we know, inquiry is done by asking questions. So the very heart of the subject that we're teaching is about asking questions. It's not about seeing models presented from the teacher. It's not about replicating those models from the teacher or using examples to do similar problems. It's actually named this by the ancients, the ancient Greeks at least, because they knew that this trained the mind to learn through inquiry, learn through questions, to develop models, to use those models to draw conclusions. So I find this pretty fascinating actually, that um, that's the origins of the word. It doesn't actually mean the study of shape and number and magnitude and the properties which define them. So if we could, in, introduce this idea to our students as a way of practicing mathematics, I think it would really transform their approach to it. All right. So since it is the act of learning, you know, it's crucial that we understand the way students relate to their ignorance and help them through it. And we want to teach them how, how to relate to it. So I like to use analogies to guide myself as a teacher. Uh, I say as a coach is to an athlete, so too a teacher is to a student. And so just as a coach uses tools, you know, here we have a rope ladder. And I don't know if you've any ever seen youth sports, but this is something that's used a lot in the youth sports uh, that my kids played growing up. Uh, the rope ladder itself is not something that's used in the, in the game itself. No player ever says, why are we doing these activities? Uh, but they know what the, the rope ladder is for. So I like to envision the rope ladder as mathematics. So just as a coach uses this rope ladder, so too a teacher uses math to train. The coach uses the rope ladder to train the athlete's body. So too a teacher uses mathematics to train a student's mind. So my question is, one of my ongoing questions is, since I'm really teaching the subject, which I want them to learn, but then I also want them to learn the deeper side of it, which is how to be a good learner. What are the skills that I need to teach a student in on how to learn? And that's this art of asking questions is one of the main skills. So if you don't know how to ask questions, then you definitely cannot be a learner. So I'd like you guys to take some time now. Thank you for that prelude and for the introduction to the context of the talk here. And just please think to yourself, what questions do students ask? Specific questions. And how do teachers reply to them? And if you can, could you please categorize them? Uh, I'll, I'll give you guys about a minute here to write some questions, some answers in the chat to this. If you could take your time. I spent a uh, couple weeks collecting the questions that my students ask so I could study them myself. And I had a feeling and some intuitions about them, but I wanted to be a little bit more scientific about this. So I'd like to compare some notes with you guys here. Yes. Uh, Marianne, could you maybe say more about what a proximity question is? Oh, I got, it's that's from the thinking classrooms model. They ask a question because you're near them. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
I see another uh, BTC practitioner. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Can you explain it again? <laughs> Make it an easy question. <laughs> Oh, I love this. You guys are, are, this is excellent. Do we have the same students? Oh, I forgot that one, Carlos. Okay, so as you guys look through the chat here, I was just wondering, uh, I know these things end with a question mark, but are any of them actually a question? And what I mean by that is, are they um, something about the topic? Like, are they specific? Are they, do they have to do with the content? You know, notice I'm, I'm going to read through a few of them here. Can you explain it again? Yeah, that's a question. Ex make it make it an easy question. I love that. I don't understand. I, I yeah, that's going to come up here too. Can I use the bathroom? That might be the truest question we've seen on the whole <laughs> list so far. Do it. <laughs> when am I ever going to use this? Oh yeah. Oh, I love that. My answer to the to the question, just so you know, when am I ever going to use this, is to refer to the idea that mathematics is about learning again. And it's designed to train their minds. So I just ask them when they're going to use their mind. <laughs> I know they don't like that because they've been raised to be pragmatists. Um, but um, that's not something that I think is applicable or for us to answer. Oh, yes. What if the question was changed? Yeah, that's a very playful one, Sue. All right. So these are some of the ones that I came up with. I don't get this. And the teacher says, well, let me show you. And that's not a question. Again, it's a statement of confusion. Help me. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, and then the teacher says, OK, let's do it together. That's not a question. Again, it's just a statement of confusion. Uh, how do you do number 17? The teacher says something like, you know, you use the quadratic formula or the dreaded keep play, keep keep change flip or something or you know the answer with the steps uh, that's procedural conceptual uh, how do you solve for x and number five uh, again try that's a procedure question they're just trying to solve for some they tell them to solve for something where do they get the two from like maybe if they're looking at the solutions or something and the teacher explains where it comes from it's a procedure uh, how do you come up with that you know, I, the teacher could say, I looked at the question and it showed me this. These are all procedure-based questions. A few more types of questions. So notice we have some questions that are not questions and even that they don't end in, in question marks. They're just statements of confusion and a kind of a, a not knowing in that way. We have other ones that are ba basically procedural. Uh, what does the B value stand for? Teacher replies again as, with an answer. That's conceptual. And then let's go to the bottom ones. You know, one that happens very often is this right? And why do you do this? And is it right? You know, when a student asks, is it right? What they're really asking for is, does this math match the principles or does this match the rules? I know they want to know if they're right or wrong, but what what we as teachers should be seeing is that they're asking, is this true? And if it's true, it must match the principles and they're looking for justifications and the why that you do this. So as we look over these questions, I'd like you to think for a moment, what does this student present to the teacher? And what does the student walk away with from the, what they get from the teacher? And what do they learn about the content? And what did they learn about themselves? So if we can just take a moment to focus on that part for a moment. 
think about this for a second. What does the student walk away with? And what do they learn about the content? And from all these responses of the ways that teachers reply. Now, I'm not saying you guys reply these ways. I, these are ways I've replied in the past. Um, I definitely don't try to reply that way now, as you'll see further into our discussion here. Um, but as you look back over the questions, what are the students walking away with from these interactions? You know, what do they learn about themselves when they ask this question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is very key. This this moment right here is definitive. This moment that that we're exploring is something that's been done for time immortal between teachers and students. And I understand why I and other teachers would reply in this way. Um, Yes. Yeah. 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 They, they learn they don't know something and that they cannot generate the knowledge from themselves. This is excellent. Wow. I, I feel like I've found my people here. <laughs> Thank you all for attending this. You know, if we're not already following each other on Twitter, please reach out. I love to keep in contact. Yeah. The Tracy, definitely that the teachers are the givers of the mathematical knowledge. This is so they, they in one way learn some helplessness from these responses. And I'm not saying that's not a good idea to give answers to students' questions. Like if there's two minutes left in class and I have to use the bathroom and a student asks me a question, I'm not going to do a full exploration with them on the nature of the question. I'm probably going to give them an answer. Or if there's something else happening in the class that we can't sit with their question and hold space for them to explore that. Those are all great ways of responding in the moment, but we don't want them to be our go-to way of being because they keep passing on this model of learned helplessness and also of the teacher is the only one that can know math. And we especially teach a subject that is not just knowable by the teacher, it's knowable by everyone. So now, conversely on the other side, how does the teacher react to the student? What does the teacher present to them? And what does the teacher walk away with? I think we've kind of already covered that. The teacher just sees the student doesn't know and the teacher gets to present to them, them as a knower, they're the giver of it. Yes, well said. And they walk away with the fact that they think they've helped the student in that moment. So. It's kind of like this, please give me the answer and the, the wise knowing teacher there, you know, yes, I have all the answers right here. <laughs> Yes, yeah, totally. Like giving a fish instead of teaching the fish. Yeah. But this is the classic way that we're taught because we have a model of teaching that is explicit instruction of as the teachers at the knower. Even the lec the lecture and the lectern itself that used to be in my classroom when I moved into it is a sign of preaching uh, of the of the preacher giving up giving a sermon in some way. So we want to move away from that. So now, now that we see kind of the way that things are traditionally done, a question is really, a you know, the root of it, the word says quest. It's It focuses the mind on a path, on a path to travel. It's also like a center of gravity. Um, so for me, like when I have a question, I like to hold a question. And when I hold a question, answers will come. And the more I hold the question, the deeper the question goes. And it sends me on a path of a quest. So we need to learn how to nurture that for our students and how to keep them in a state of that not knowing. There are two main methods that we can do other than give them the answer to help them with this. The first one I call the so-called Socratic method. And I call it the so-called Socratic method because I've read Platonic philosophy for, like I said, like 27 years now. And Socrates 
is been shown to like, sometimes it guides people to insights and people think like, well, he knows all of the questions. He knows everything that he's asking. When in fact, if you were to read the Mino, he clearly says he doesn't have knowledge in multiple places. He says he doesn't have knowledge, but he's willing to explore. And that's where the definition, where I learned the definition of mathematics is learning in is that book called the Mino. So this is something though, as an introduction to the students that you can do one-on-one -on -one with a student. So you wanna take them through their own questions. First, you wanna help them to see that, that they have a question and see what the question is. And you need to help them find the ways to answer them. So let's just sit on this for a moment. When a student comes up and says, I don't know, that's clear, but what don't they know? And what is the content of what they don't understand? Um, you need to get them to put words on that. There's a question in there, like a question like, well, what does the B value stand for? Or what is a slope of a line? Or what is a proportion? Or I don't understand the next step when I'm supposed to simplify a fraction or make equivalent fractions. So we need to do what I call holding space with the students. When they come up to us, you know, first we want to see that they're stung, like their bell has been rung. Oftentimes they're in a state of confusion and confusion is not a question. Confusion is a feeling, just a feeling of like, I don't know. And, you know, a spinning, a dizziness of some sort, uh, a disorientation, um, a moment when our mind's vision is blurred. So we need to see that that's the state that they're in and find the confusion and then lead them through this, this process of holding space for them. So we see that they're not knowing and we want to move them. We want to move them from their not knowing to and, and this feeling they have to finding an idea, a method or a skill that's not understood. Because if they're just in that state of help me or will you do it for me? Sure, we can come through like I did with my two and three year olds and tie their shoes for them. But as was said before, if we just continue to tie their shoes, they're not gonna know how to proceed. So they need to get precise. What is the thing that they don't know? And that's very hard to do because if you just ask them, what don't you know, it's too blunt of a, of a tool. So you have to kind of go around the outside to help them with this. So we want to hold, hold the space for them. And especially, you know, with patience and compassion and understanding of what they're going through, because we know we've been through this learning process before. So you want to help them, help them find, find the pieces. Ask open-ended questions like point to the part that you don't understand. Say things like, can you start the question for me? Uh, write down everything you know. And then once they write down everything they know or they start the question, or if they can point to the part that they don't understand, we can then prompt them maybe with a little bit of vocabulary to remind them of the concepts that we've been instructing them on. Once we remind them of the, and the concepts that we've been instructing them on, now their mind can start to swirl around those and find memories again uh, of, those I, of those ideas. So other parts. You know, we wanna ask them to find pathways or methods to solve their questions. So if they would say like, I don't know how to do number 17, uh, I'd be like, okay, well, what's 17 asking for? What is, what, what is, what would your answer look like? And so from their answer, from what we, what they think the answer would look like, if they have an idea, if not, we can even tell them say like, well, the answer will be something like this and just give them little bits as much as possible. I have a mantra, which is to be deliberately less helpful. And so, and compassionately though, I mean, obviously if I see that the student is starting to like get angry and sweat and can't handle that anymore, then I proceed in a different matter. But if they're patient and they're willing to persevere, then we can have them look backwards from this and say like, well, if this is the answer, what kind of things would we, would we need to solve this? 
And so we're still searching for maybe that thing that they don't know, but we're right now providing the structure for them so that they can go through this. As they go through this, they might start to gain clarity or they often start to, to gain clarity about what it is that they don't know. And they're like, oh, I get it. I don't know how to move from the setting up of the question to, to the next step with how do I evaluate these numbers or I don't understand at this point how to factor. And now they've got their question, a very precise question in that they don't have a feeling anymore. They have a, um, a concept or a method or an idea that they're looking for. So now in the end, if you've done the so-called Socratic method right, they will come to an aha moment. And so let me just remind you, if they're completely stuck, then ask them guided questions, structured questions. Take every bit of steps that you know and turn it into a question. Be like, okay, well, how do we set up the first step? What would you do next? What do you think about this variable over here? How are we going to take care of the fact that we have X's on both sides? How are we going to take care of the fact that we don't know this part of the problem? And then as you help them and guide them with these questions, at some moment, they have this aha moment. And they'll think, oh, I get it. They don't get it completely. They get it because you help structure them. So many times when I explored philosophy with my teacher, Pierre Grimes, he would bring me through an exploration and, and a structured exploration. By the end, I'd be like, oh, aha, I understand. And then when I got home, I wouldn't have that structure and I wouldn't understand it as much. So I would add that once they have that aha moment, we need them to review this. You know, they, they need to look in the rear view mirror and they need to reflect on it because you've given them the questions again, you're still the provider of the mathematical knowledge. So ask them, hey, what questions did we ask ourselves? What was the process we went through? Do you remember how we started? How do we work through that? And then get them to do, to put words on them. So by doing this, what they're then seeing is they're getting to imitate us in a little, in a little way that's still us as the bearer of mathematical knowledge, but now they have a model to proceed because before they had no model and they needed that, that structure. And we could do this over and over and over again, but we need them to walk away seeing the questions that led to it. And especially because what happens when they come to the test and they don't know? What happens when they come to their project or what happens when they come to the homework when they get at home on their homework on their own and they're like, wow, that was amazing. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember how to do that myself. So I like to always have them then write down what we did or put into words what we did. And if the student can go through the beginning to end to me again, then I know that they at least have it on their own in that one moment. And they formed a memory because they've membered all the pieces together as a whole and they can then recall that later on their own. So this part is the, the, the structured part, the structured part with us present. Uh, the final part, the second main method, I call it the stu student self empowerment method. It's like, how do we teach these students? You know, how do we teach them to do this? Because it's a skill, and I have to say, it's a skill that I've learned through lots of different practices of exploration, exploring philosophy, exploring mathematics, exploring my own questions, meditation. It's taken me a long time. I don't think it would have taken me that long, though, if I had been started to teach it as, a, or been, been taught it and practiced it as a child. So I'd like for us to practice this uh, in our classroom. So I'm going to give you some steps here of how to of how to bring teach students how to ask good questions because all those questions that they asked above before and the ones that you listed i wouldn't even consider those real questions because they don't get to the the actual thing they they, they don't know a good a good question has a few components but before i preach and basically go against the model of what i'm trying to bring you guys through could you guys take a moment please and write down what you think makes for a good question? Uh, 
and take some time. <laughs> that question itself might be pretty tough. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> I see I'm around some pretty awesome learners here. Yes, I love all of these. Some of these are really some great examples of good questions. That's for sure. Will this always work? What would happen if I change this? These are some playful ideas. The, I'm curious about what assessing and advancing questions are. I think I have an idea uh, about that. Um, like something that maybe pushes a point further. Uh, and I like, Stacy. thank you very much for calling them specific, you know, specific questions. So, a good, a good question is precise. It is complete in that it covers everything we don't know. It also contains the context of what we're trying to learn. And it contains as much as possible, like why we, what we've done to solve something. I know that maybe doesn't seem like a question itself, but it hones the mind into a certain direction again, kind of like, um, you know, a telescope in that way, focusing in on something as much as possible, if that's the kind of question we're looking for, or it broadens things out more. Um, specifically, what we're going to work on is like those questions, like when the students are working on the parts themselves and they come up in you and they ask for help, how can we get them to ask a better question? Because going back here, man, do I get a lot of these questions? You know, help, how do you do number 17? My favorite response to that is to be like, well, I draw one, <laughs> and then I draw a seven. Sometimes I put a line through a little seven. It, sometimes that upsets them. I'm just, I'm like, but what do you mean, how do I do it? And they'll be like, no, I want to know how do you do the steps? And I'll be like, well, I, I use my memory, and I think about the, you know, like, I, I try to show them that that question is not the question that they want answered because the wording of that question is about me. How do I do it? They, won't, they don't wanna know how I do it, they wanna know how they do it. So I'm very precise. So every word of a question should be taken very literally, very, very literally. And we want them to see what happens here because in the end, we're looking for them to become self-directed learners. We're looking for them to take on the self-empowerment, to be able to guide themselves through the lesson. We know that, like, as, like was said before, if we catch fish but don't teach them how to fish, then they're always going to be, be dependent upon us. And maybe that works well for our egos and because we get to be the big knowers in the classroom, but we've failed them because we've left them insufficient and we've neglected to make them self-sufficient in that regard. So... First step, hey, give them assign, give them an assignment and give them some time to work. I've transitioned to a, a majority building thinking classrooms model. If you haven't heard of that, I highly suggest looking it up and, and looking and trying to practice it a little bit and reach out to me if you want to discuss it. Um, so, but sometimes I still have students working as individuals and they come to the, they come to me and they ask questions. And so what I like to do is have them write their questions out completely, like on the whiteboard. I have whiteboards all around my room. So I'll be like, hey, if you got a question, stand up and go to the board. And this is a specific lesson of, on how to teach questions. Uh, that model is called the Thinking Classrooms Model. It's by Peter Lilly Lilliadal. 
and he wrote a book called Building Thinking Classrooms and the orange book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's pretty excellent. I know it's kind of faddish right now, uh, but it's faddish for a reason. It has transformed my classroom. And it that practice alone gives students a lot of practice in asking good questions. Um, so if we're doing a, a lesson that's more guided and structured rather than, than them exploring first and then formalizing later, as my friend Sarah Stecker likes to point out, uh, have them write their questions all around the room. And then they share these with everyone. As kind of like a practice, I normally don't believe their first question is their first question or is their real question. It's their rough draft of a question. So you wanna help them to edit the question a little bit, but don't do it yourself. Ask the students to do it. Say like, hey, what does so-and-so's question ask for? And I, I did this recently and one of the girls in the class says, well, it's asking how you do the question. And then I said, okay, go back up to the board. And then she wrote down, how do I do the question? I said, okay, well, what's your question asking? And it says, it's asking for a method. And then she, and then I asked, okay, so now could you restate your question again to try to ask for like, what is what kind of method you're looking for? And then she she got it more precise. And so by having the students comment on the questions, the the questioner themselves will start to see, oh, that's not my question at all. That's not what I meant to ask. So it gives them a sounding board actually to see like maybe that wasn't what they were looking for. And so, yeah, totally. So after that, after you get comments, you want them to restate or reword the question, have them write it down again. If the question is still unclear, then this is where I as a teacher would come in and I wanna ask some clarifying questions ask them like, well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? And then once I get answers and I'm trying to get them to use as much mathematically appropriate language as possible. So I try not to, to accept questions that use common students speak and I'll accept that. But since I'm training them for long-term growth in math, I want as much math language as possible. So I tend to be a little playful with them, you know, and reject their questions. And then I have them restate the question in the most clear and precise terms. And some often when I do that, I ask the student then to complete the question. The most incredible part about this is I'm not lying like eight out of 10 times when a student finally goes through this process to discover their question and see it clearly in the mind, in their mind with precise math language, with direction towards what they're really wondering about they'll be able to answer the question themselves. And it was because they didn't ask a good question that they didn't get a good answer. So this process of teaching them to, to refine their questions leads to them either being able to answer it themselves or, or leads to something else. And this is the last part I'd like to focus on here before we open it up for questions and comments. You know, as a teacher, it's important for us to diagnose our students and like what they don't know. So again, another metaphor, as a doctor is to a patient, so to a teacher is to a student. I'm not saying a student is ill when they have questions, but they do have something that needs to be addressed and helped with. And so what I think the student learns from this process is one, they learn that they don't know something Two, they learn exactly what it is they don't know. Often, not always, they learn why they are confused because they'll say like, oh, I'm confused because this is the thing I didn't know. And I'm not confused because, I, um, because I'm dumb. I'm not confused because the teacher didn't teach it. I'm confused because something's not clear to me. So this is really saving the heart of, a, what a, of what learning is to me. Like learning is not about, you know, performing so well on exams and getting A's as much as my students and my own beloved daughter would like to say. Um, it's about discovering these things that we don't know and working our way through them. 
this skill that we're that we're teaching them and that we're getting them to practice is lifelong beneficial. It is transformative to them. So once the student knows what it is they're trying to learn, then they can seek it out. So oftentimes when a student at the end gets their question most clearly to me and states it, I don't answer it then. I'm like, okay, well now where would you find resources to come up with that? And the reason why is because I trust in their intellect. I know that they can solve it. I know that they have the mind to do it. And I'm reaffirming that in them and helping them build that math identity that is strong. And when they walk away and they say, oh, I can answer this, or I know now how to go find the answer and they find the answer, they're no longer dependent. They're independent learners. And then often they'll be like, hey, thanks, Mr. Bean. And I'm like, thanks for what? You know, they're like, thanks for teaching me. And I'm like, what did I teach you? Or when I help them hold the space to find their questions and they get it and they're like, aha, I get it. You know, and they'll be like, oh, and I'll be like, so do you still need my help? And they'll be like, no. And then I say, oh, I must have a halo of knowledge. Like I just come near you <laughs> and, and you, you know, you're enlightened by my presence in some way. And, um, which is a joke, of course, I don't really believe that. And so this is what the teacher learns by going through this exploration of uh, making their question precise or what the student learns. Here's what we learn. We, of course, learn that the student doesn't know. We learn exactly what they don't know. You know how often have in the past has a student asked me a question and I jump in and I give a glorious answer to their question. And then they're like, okay, I got it, Mr. Bean. And either they didn't want to make me feel bad to tell me that they don't understand, or they accepted the appearance of learning, of knowing, and walked away and didn't know. But I never learned what they didn't know. So how as I am a teacher, if I'm, imagine a doctor coming in and you're like, I'm sick. And they're like, okay, they start giving you shots, you know, and start giving you pills or treatments, but they, they need to diagnose you first. So this is a great way of diagnosing the students and really finding what it is they don't know, not blaming ourselves or them, but just discovering the information. And then once, and we can even discover what's causing it, like maybe something in our own lesson or something in the participation or the structure or the activity that we did that didn't bring them to understand it. And then we get a question in the end, which is we get to ask ourselves, what do I do now to bring the student through their ignorance to knowledge if I'm going to proceed with them and not send them away. So these are the three types. I just want to summarize them here for us, uh, ways that teachers respond to students. There's the transactional method. You know, we ask questions, they give us answers. There's the guided structured semi-Socratic questions. We ask them guided structured questions that we know will lead them to the answer through rational steps. And the student self-empowering one, that uh, leaves them with the ability to ask questions, leaves them with the ability to search for the answer, and leaves them knowing then that their mind is sharp and capable of doing the mathematics. So, you know, I would like you to just think now, think of some topics that you can, that you're covering the next week. What are the questions the students are gonna ask? How will you respond to them now, especially maybe given this talk that we've had? And what are you gonna do to help nurture their questions? and especially try to leave them with the question, you know? And, you know, Socrates says, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. Thank you again, Socrates. If you're looking for an example of how Socrates has done this, he's got a great example in the Mino. He takes a boy who's never been taught geometry through a set of guided questions to discover how to double the area of a square. It's really incredible, actually. And, ooh, a sample interchange. Carlos, uh, you might have to email me on that one because we're running late on time here, and I don't, I'd have to ask even more so. And the very practice of mathematics trains learners in the skills necessary to be good learners of anything. Once again, it is called learning. And so this skill of asking questions is one of the most fundamental skills that we have. And then now we're going to open up for any questions or reflections you guys might have.
any insights or practices you guys have on helping students learn the art of asking questions? The last two questions here. What is this here? Sue, what are the last two questions on, on the page that you referred us to? Uh, Jody, the recording um, it will be available tomorrow by using the same link that you use to log on to this. Oh, what if and what else? Yes. Those questions, Sue, are really awesome, especially like um, this is one of my favorite things to do in the thinking models and the thinking building thinking classrooms model. Um, oftentimes, you know, students will proceed through the thin slice step by step instructions, a step by step building lesson to come to the end. They'll be like, oh, we're done. And then I'll ask something like, yeah, is there another way that you can re represent this? Uh, what if we were to change these conditions? So those are great questions. Or ask, you know, a leading advancing question, as was said earlier, like, what do you think this will affect if now that you've learned this, what what part of the math do you think that this it opens up to us even more? Carlos, you asked, uh, is it helpful to review that example? What if you've gone over a problem similar to number 17? Is it helpful to review that example? Um, it, it, you know, every tool we have as a teacher is helpful, uh, especially when used in the right context. This method of nurturing students' questions and holding students' questions, I don't always use, again, because sometimes the context isn't right. Um, I would say if I've given them an example, like example number 17 uh, or question 17, and I've given them an example, it would be pretty helpful to review, especially if you have students who are maybe haven't seen it or cannot verbalize their question. Or they're like, I just don't know where to start. Like, I don't understand how to, to even begin the question. And you'd be like, okay, well, let's, let's look over the, let's look over the, example that was shown and then you can again point to them to say like which part they don't get usually if a student's at that state and they're like i don't know where to begin i'd be like okay let's read the question and tell me in the question itself that you're being asked which part of the question causes you to get confused which part of the question gets you a little blurry in your mind or do you not understand so if you do have the example written out right in front of them with the pieces as a whole for them, then you want to find the precise one and start the questioning process with them at that moment to get them to put words on it to make their question most precise in that in that moment. Yes, for those of you that are interested in the Mino example, uh, I did put a link of it in the slides. Uh, the very first slide has a QR code, and you're welcome to look it up. Um, it's called the slave boy example. If you want to look it up online, I also did the link takes you right to the section in the text of how he guides the boy to the discovery of how to double the area of the square. It's also, uh, an exploration into the nature of the soul. So there's a very spiritual side to it. I'll save that for another time. So if you guys would like to explore that, uh, you can explore that on your own.
Thank you, Joshua, so much for sh being here and sharing your practice with us. Uh, I hope you'll be able to stick around for a couple of more minutes to see if MB have any more questions. I will. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your questions and, and your responses. Reach out if you'd like to discuss more. Uh, here, I'll type my email into the chat. We do not have a, we meet every couple of weeks. So the next time would be December 27th, but we are not having any presentations on that day. Next time we'll be meeting on January 10th with Sandhya Raman, and she'll be talking to us about social justice in a math classroom. Oh, an excellent presentation. I got to see her at CMC North, California Math Teacher Convention North. A wonderful one. Uh, Trevor, you've asked, what's your favorite routine to help kids improve on or increase the amount of questions they ask? Wow, that's a good one. Um, my favorite one is to uh, run, at the beginning of the year, just some puzzles where they have to generate lots of questions. Uh, also, to be deliberately, to deliberately not answer questions and to get them to ask questions. The one I, I offered up of having them come to the whiteboard where everybody writes a question down uh, is excellent. Uh, that way they get to see like other people have questions, other people have the same questions. A lot of it starts with culture building of like telling them that we appreciate um, their questions. We appreciate that every, nobody's going to know everything. And or saying like we're like uh, another activity I've done, as I said, I before we begin, before I start exploring questions with you, I need to see five questions on the board. You you have to ask a certain amount of questions before I'll, I'll proceed. And so um, I, I think it comes, a lot of this comes down to also our attitudes that we hold in the classroom. As a teacher, we are the bearers of a vision and we're holding kind of the vision of what learning is for the students together. And so if we hold a vision of curiosity ourselves, curiosity about the students, curiosity about their thinking, curiosity about their own methods, then they will learn to generate questions and, and share them more. Thank you so much everyone for being with us tonight. We'll be back on January 10th with Sandhya Raman talking to about uh, talking to us about social justice in a math classroom. Thank you, Joshua, for being here with us today.